you know, really proud of the staff's efforts. Uh, it's been an unusual recruiting process, uh, mostly done electronically through Zoom. But I think, you know, uh, our guys had the vision and foresight to see early on in the process that, you know, there probably wouldn't be camps, uh, so on and so forth. You know, this is back in March and April even. Uh, and uh, we were a little bit more aggressive uh, early uh, in the process than we normally would be. And, uh, you know, I've never known a, a coach on a signing day that didn't love his recruiting class. But I think this is a really strong class. Uh, almost every one of these guys had FBS offers and many of them had Ivy League offers too. So you're getting the best combinations. You're getting uh, good athletes that, you know, are high achievers in the classroom. And usually those things are tied in hand in hand. And I think these are guys that will represent the Dukes really well on the field and represent uh, JMU off the field, you know, with class and integrity. And, and we're excited about them. And hopefully we get back to a normal uh, fall in uh, 21 and these guys can enjoy a kind of a normal freshman year. All right. We'll now open it up for questions. First comes from Greg Medea from the Daily News Record in Harrisonburg. Hey, Kurt, uh, the challenges with, with putting this class together during the pandemic, no in-person recruiting, you touched on it a little bit. Uh, what, what, what were your biggest challenges with it? And, and I guess, how did you guys get creative uh, to, to overcome some of those challenges? Well, you know, I think number one, uh, JMU is a great brand, uh, you know, that only gets stronger every year uh, because we've had great leadership here through the years at all levels and a commitment to be successful. And I think every good year has sort of stacked on the last and we're very attractive, uh, you know, to the student athletes coming out of high school. So most of the guys that we recruit have multiple FBS offers. And, it, you know, if you wanna be a part of a championship program uh, that's committed to excellence on and off the field, it's gonna develop you to your fullest potential as a person, a student, and a football player and have a great four or five year experience, then, you know, JMU uh, is a great choice. So I think, you know, we knew there weren't gonna be camps in July and June and uh, the, the ability to sort of watch guys uh, perform uh, on the field wasn't gonna be there or to meet them face to face. Um, with the Zooms, uh, being able to, you know, talk with the prospect, the parents and, uh, and get the important people at JMU involved academically, you know, strength and conditioning, that kind of thing. So it really uh, fell into place. We were quite pleased uh, with, the, with the process. Uh, we actually had to kind of turn it off and shut it down. Uh, you know, we probably could have signed 10 more quality student athletes. Uh, that's the challenge, you know, with 63 scholarships. So, uh, you know, it's all about recruiting and development in this business. And, you know, that's the recruiting phase right now. And, and now we got to get them in here and, uh, you know, developing their fullest potential. I, I was going to ask, I, I know one of the prospects had told me, uh, Toner, the, the offensive lineman, that, that you got on a FaceTime to offer him. Is it a common thing for you to do as the head coach? Not, not every head coach, I, don't, I think, would do that. Uh, get on a FaceTime and, and talk to the prospects uh, yourself. That, that's how we did it this year with the majority of them because of uh, the opportunities to visit campus we knew wasn't going to be there. So we sort of had a peck and order. There was a lot of uh, film evaluation involved and we had a process where, you know, I talked to the guys we were serious about, did most of the offering. Uh, obviously, the recruiting coach, position coach, uh, strength and conditioning coordinator and key people from academics. So I, I thought Mike Shanahan uh, did a really nice job of organizing that whole process. And I, I thought we did a, a, as good a job as we could given the circumstances. And then just, just last one for, for me for right now, uh, the offensive line, three offensive linemen in the class, was that a priority for you guys? Yeah, I think the offensive line is always a priority. I think you've got to recruit guys at that position yearly. Uh, to me, it's the most important unit on the team. Anytime you have a good offensive line, you've heard me say this, you know, a thousand times, uh, you have a chance to have a really good football team. And I really like the, uh, the guys that we signed last year uh, on the offensive line. We had a chance to see them in practice in the fall. And I really like this group too. Uh, we've got some, you know, athletic, big, powerful guys that are smart and can think on their feet and, uh, you know, Robo will do a great job of developing them uh, on the field, and Derek will do a great job of developing, 
in the weight room and, you know, with the speed development and getting their weight where we want it to be and their body fat. So uh, offensive line is, uh, you can't have enough of them. Next questions will come from Wayne Epps from the Richmond Times Dispatch. Yeah, hey, uh, with guys, you know, using the extra year of eligibility and coming back in the fall of 21, um, just how much did you maybe have to adjust your thinking a little bit with this class and maybe scale down numbers a tad bit just to accommodate for um, guys who know will, will be coming back in the fall? Yeah, well, you know, the way it's going to work is your seniors uh, in the fall are just going to be like extras. So they won't count on your 63. And uh, so, you know, we work from the premise that this is what our number would have been had the seniors graduated. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of commitments early before really the seniors were even given the extra year. Uh, you know, we had pretty much the class was already done. So there was a little bit of tweaking at the tail end. Maybe we felt like we didn't need seven tight ends or something like that and needed to create a little bit of space. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it fell into place nicely. And, uh, you know, we've already got our eyes on the next one. And then uh, how much more important maybe did the relationships become this year in recruiting because, you know, guys weren't able to come to see some of the amenities, see the facilities and things like that. You mentioned, you know, of course, FaceTiming guys and things like that. So did that become even more important relationships between staff and players in this recruiting process? Well, I, I think the content, uh, information content was critical to be able to deliver it, you know, in a 15 to 30 minute package. Uh, so that when people got off the call, they understood, you know, what James Madison was all about uh, in terms of the brand, uh, the academic opportunities, what it was like being a student at JMU, uh, you know, football, the tradition, uh, what it's like in a locker room, the culture, uh, the tremendous resources we have here academically, uh, sports medicine, uh, you know, the commitment throughout the university to be the best you can be. and. Uh, you know, the facility. So, um, you know, I think that we did a really good job of presenting James Madison uh, through the Zoom calls. And I think, you know, people made decisions, uh, you know, based on that content. I think for, for the prospects early on, I think it was a challenge uh, because, you know, they didn't know if they would be able to make visits, go to camps, stuff like that. And you could, you could sense in April, uh, there was hesitancy. We weren't pushing anybody. We weren't pressuring anybody. But I, I, you know, as I, could, I felt like I had a better idea what was gonna happen three months from now than they did. But then it seemed like around the end of May, uh, they all started to kind of get it. And you, know, you saw the commitments rolling in across the country that, hey, you know, these opportunities to visit places isn't gonna happen. We're going to have to make decisions based on the information available right now. Your next couple of questions will come from Dave Thomas from Harrisonburg Radio Group. Hey, Coach. Happy holidays. Hope you're well. Happy holidays. <laughs> Tell me about your recruiting style. I've talked to coaches who say, listen, I'll go to English teachers and go around the community and ask about the kid because it's about character as well as the academics and the athleticism. What do you put a lot of stock in and – being limited to staying in Harrisonburg to recruit, how did you accomplish some of those goals this year? Well, you know, they got to check as many boxes as possible. And, and I'm the kind of guy that will look at it. I mean, I'll look at all the transcripts. I'll calculate the core grade point average. I'll look at the absences. I'll look at the tardies because that tells me something. And, you know, what kind of uh, family background, uh, you know, they, they grew up in. There's a lot of good players out there. I'm more into performance and not potential. Uh, you know, I think first you form your habits, then your habits form you. And in life, you got freedom of choice, but not freedom of consequence. And, but yet I also understand that we have a tremendous influence on 17 to 21-year-old young men, and we're not getting finished products. So uh, I recognize that we have a great brand, uh, one of the strongest in the country. And we're going to present it as honestly and professionally as possible. And I think the right people, it, it will appeal to. And if, if we're not for you, we're not for you for whatever reason. So, you know, we're, we'll go up against the big boys. We're not afraid to do that. Uh, we had some guys that had power five offers and chose James Madison. And, uh, you know, so, you know, here, here's what we have to offer. If it appeals to you, great. Um, 
we, we're really not going to beg and plead. We're just going to do the best job we can of presenting James Madison University. But, you know, when a guy does verbally commit, then, you know, to us, a commitment means something. That word means something. And, you know, if, if uh, you know, prospect wants to go visit another school after he's committed and starts, then, you know, then this probably isn't the place for you. On that note of, of having FBS guys getting getting FBS offers, there's been a lot of talk this week about the college football playoff and who the four teams are going to be and who should be there and and blah, blah, blah. And I remember having a conversation with, with Juwan last year at the national championship. And he says, playing in a playoff and playing for a championship means so much more than playing for a bowl game. Do you get that from your recruits? And, and is that in your pitch any at all? Listen, you've got a chance to legitimately be on a big stage and play for a national championship where if you go to some FBS schools, realistically, you're not going to have that opportunity. It's definitely in our pitch, along with, you know, I said this in my opening press conference two years ago. There's very few schools in the country who win a national championship year in, year out. Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, North Dakota State, JMU are probably the top five. And, okay, why is that? Well, you know, there's a commitment from the university to be great. There's a financial commitment. We've had stability and leadership, and everything we do is first class. And I think when they see our facilities in person and talk with our people or do it via Zoom, uh, they, they recognize that. Um, you know, there are some guys that want to play FBS football, plain and simple. And, you know, they grew up and that's what they wanted to do. And you're not going to change their mind. And you have to recognize that as a recruiter. And recruiting time is money. You got to know where to spend your time. And, you know, I think there's a lot of guys that can be successful uh, at James Madison University. Uh, you just got to choose who the guys you think are the best ones. They have to assimilate your program and you have a great culture, you know, then, uh, you know, rising tide lifts all the boats. And I think that's what happens here is guys come and we have great leadership in the locker room. We've great tradition, great accountability. There's expectations and, and we get, we get people's best. And lastly, just for me, at least just talk about your focus on the state of Virginia, eight of your 12 coming from the Commonwealth. You know, I learned a long time ago, my first job as a recruiting coordinator was from Johnny Majors at Pitt in 1993. Pitt was down back then. Uh, you know, they hired Coach Majors maybe to kind of wave his magic wand and restore the magic. And uh, I really learned a lot uh, those first couple of years. And, you know, but sometimes the, the further away you go, uh, you, the better the prospects look. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's not the case. Uh, this is a great recruiting state. It's a great SCS recruiting state and an FBS recruiting state. There's a lot of players here. And uh, we probably could fill our entire class really from the state of Virginia. But, you know, we don't want to overlook a single prospect in Virginia. Uh, you know, I can handle bad news. But I don't like surprises. I tell the coaches that all the time. So, like, if there's a prospect I see that gets an offer from, you know, somebody we're competing against or an FBS school and, and I don't know about them, then, you know, I'm not very pleased. So we take great pride in covering the state, blanketing the state, doing a great job. And Maryland's probably the number two place for us right now. All right. Your next questions will come from Noah Ziegler from The Breeze. Hey, Coach. Uh, kind of similar to Greg's question earlier, you signed three linebackers and two safeties. How important was it to get those commitments on that side of the ball, considering the amount of players that graduated or transferred? Well, you know, we, we felt since we got here that we needed to kind of build up our linebacker depth a little bit because – Holloway and Ward were seniors and Kelvin, you know, be a senior. Now we didn't know that all the seniors were going to get extra years when these got some of these guys committed, but uh, you know, like Skylar Martin, I think is a tremendous prospect uh, as is Jalen Walker, as is Binkowski. Those guys have all the attributes you're looking for. We really like Taurus Jones. Who's a young player that uh, injured his knee in fall ball. We think Julio's got a really bright future. Uh, Mateo Jackson's come on. Uh, Diamante Tucker Dorsey uh, used to be a young guy. He's not a young guy anymore. And, he, you know, he'll, he'll end up being a two, two, three-year starter here and a really good football player. So uh, we don't have many linebackers right now. The ones we have are pretty good. 
and we're going to be adding to that group. But you can't have enough of those kind of guys for special teams and different packages on defense. So I really like the linebacker group. Safety group, I like too. Uh, maybe, you know, in hindsight, could have added one more uh, because, you know, we're, we're still looking for quality depth at that position. We've got a couple safeties that are seniors. I like the two guys we got a lot. You know, Holmes played uh, in a great conference, had eight or nine FBS offers. Messiah Russell is a real long guy that excelled on both sides of the ball, can really run. I think his best football is ahead of him. So, uh, you know, like the offensive line, uh, backer and safety were a priority. You know, and then we got us a quarterback, Billy Atkins, who – you know, I mean, his what he's accomplished really without a senior season in a great conference is pretty incredible. And he's got great skills and he's really a take charge, fiery, competitive guy that's really smart and can really rip that ball and make plays, uh, extend plays. And then we signed, a, you know, Zach Horton, a tight end that, you know, I think he had like 25 tackles for losses and maybe 18 sacks as a D end. But uh, that pretty much complete Maxwell James, big receiver from North Jer from uh, Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you have a, a range or an idea of how many of these prospects are going to be enrolling early, or will none of them at all be considering kind of the circumstances? Yeah, we're not going to enroll anybody early. Um, we're encouraging everybody to play their senior season this spring. If you know if that can get launched, uh, I think it's important for their development. Uh, if this was a normal year, uh, we maybe could have brought a couple guys in uh, midterm, but uh, with the pandemic and the situation being what it is, uh, they'll all be enrolling in the fall. Uh, the NCAA uh, came out with legislation that freshmen uh, mid-year enrollees could not play in the spring. So, uh, you know, I think most of the FCS schools across the country will enroll their signees in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, can we, I know there have been a lot of kind of players entering the transfer portal. I know you can't talk about specifics, but uh, can we expect you guys to be active in it or are you guys pretty much locked up in that department? Well, you know, with the new one-time transfer rule, which will take effect in August, you know, it's, it's, it's really going to change the landscape of college football. And uh, you just, as a coach and staff, you got to adjust, adapt, and improvise a little bit. Uh, I expect, you know, across the country, you know, the portal numbers will continue to increase. Uh, we're sitting fine where we are right now. We'll go into the spring season like we are, come out, come out of the spring season and sort of evaluate, uh, you know, based on what happened on a playing field or with injury. If, if we feel like we need immediate help at a position or two, and we don't feel like we have that answer in our program. I like the high school route. I like uh, recruiting the high school guys and having them for four or five years and sort of developing them. But every once in a while, you, you do uh, have some needs. And, you know, on the defensive side of the ball, uh, we lost seven starters. Then because we didn't play, we lost two more in the fall to Virginia. And then we got a few hurt in fall ball. So, you know, we felt the need to bring a couple guys in on that side of the ball. And last question for me, uh, we're, we're almost through uh, the FBS season and we've seen so much happen with various conferences and teams. Uh, what are some takeaways that you've kind of gathered throughout the entire season that you're going to use to uh, hopefully make the spring kind of a smooth or a smoother process than some of the conferences have dealt with in FBS? Well, I think number one, when you look at the teams that have done a good job of sort of keeping their, their numbers down on the virus uh, have been a little bit more successful. And uh, it seems like team, when they have problems, it's sort of after an away game, maybe, uh, you know, where they've been in a locker room together or something like that. So I know there's been a, adjustments taking place at, at the power five level as the season's gone on. And, you know, those are discussions that we're having. So, you know, obviously you got to be flexible uh, because things can change real fast. Uh, we've done a nice job as a team uh, really from about the end of September on in keeping our numbers down. And that'll be important uh, in the season. And uh, but still having quality depth at all positions because you never know, I guess, on a Friday you could lose a few guys. And so uh, that's going to create a challenge. But uh, 
you know, to me, it'll all work out, uh, you know, through this pandemic, uh, you know, I've kind of learned to quit playing the what if game, uh, you know, will we play, will we not play? You almost got to go into it with blinders on, uh, you know, you got your plan, you got to execute your plan. And then if, if a situation arises, you got to deal with it as it arises. Thank you. Your next questions come from TJ Eck from WHSV TV. Coach, uh, when you look at your signing class, uh, I think three offensive linemen, three linebackers, and anyone that knows football or watches the game knows that those are kind of important pieces to those sides of the ball. So, so do you look at this class as kind of like a foundational class or, or a class that you can really build around with recruiting linebackers and offensive linemen as those are foundational pieces on the team? Well, you know, to me, it's, it's about stacking classes, good classes on top of each other. Like last year's class, you know, we had a chance to see them on the practice field this fall. And, and I'll take that class every year. I mean, that, that we're going to have a lot of really good players in that class. And if you just keep stacking good classes on top of each other, then, you know, you're going to have a program that's sustainable and can be successful and thrive over the long term. And uh, so, you know, every year you go in, it's numbers by position. Uh, you have your depth chart by class. And then you assess your needs and how many receivers you're going to take, tight ends, et cetera. So, um, you know, next year's class will look a little bit different uh, number-wise than this class. But, uh, you know, it's all about uh, – just stacking classes and developing players, keeping them in your program, and uh, eventually they become productive. Um, had a quarterback in the class, as you mentioned, Billy Atkins. I know you had a quarterback in, in last year's class as well. How do you approach recruiting the quarterback position? Because we know that that's the position where only one of them can be on the field at a time, and we see that position transfer a lot, especially at the FBS level. Is it uh, you look to get one every class? Is it every other class? Is it back-to-back -back classes, take one off and get another. How, how do you approach re recruiting quarterback? No, I think you want to take one a year. Uh, there were a couple of years here, I think, uh, where, Jim, you didn't take a quarterback before I arrived. So we got one last year. We got one in this class. Uh, you know, uh, the guy's got to be able to throw the ball. He's got to be able to think on his feet. He's got to be able to extend plays. Uh, you want a guy that's a winner, thinks like a coach, guy you can trust and develop. And uh, we think both of the quarterbacks that we've taken uh, are like that. I'm really excited about Billy Atkins. Uh, seems like a real eager guy. I'm really impressed with what he's done on tape. And uh, I'm anxious for him to get in the program. Uh, looking ahead to the, I guess we'll call it the regular signing day or the non-early signing day next, uh, next February. Uh, what do you anticipate what that will look like for you guys? Is there a number that you're looking to add um, during the normal signing period? Today, I'd have to say we're done. Uh, now, you know, maybe something would happen. Uh, but if we sign anybody, it won't be many, or maybe it'd be to a partial or something like that. And then finally, as we look ahead to the, the, the season you have coming up here, when, um, when do you guys anticipate starting camp? What's your schedule look like? When will guys come back from winter break? I guess kind of what's your um, schedule looking forward as we get ready for practice to start in January? Right. Well, we're in finals week right now. So uh, we had two weeks of mandatory workouts up until last week. We've got a few guys taking their finals here <clears throat> and doing some optional workouts on their own. Uh, we're going to bring the team back on January 5th and uh, they'll be tested and the results will take a couple of days. Then there's a two week period uh, where they can train uh, in the weight room, on the field. We can do walkthroughs, that kind of thing. Start camp around the 23rd of January uh, and uh, kick it off on February 20th against Moorhead State. All right, next up, we've got Kurt Dudley from JMU Athletics. Thank you, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. Coach, uh, getting back to the recruiting aspects under these conditions, uh, how much more value or stock or reliability did you have in existing relationships, not with the uh, players, as, as Wayne was talking about, developing those, but those high school coaches and other contacts that you may have in the region, did that take even a higher value to you right now since you couldn't do some of the normal things? 
Yeah, I think it was really good that, um, you know, when we came back from the national championship game, there was still <clears throat> a week or two to go in recruiting. And uh, we spent most of that time in the state of Virginia, which I think ended up being really good for us because we didn't have a spring recruiting season. And uh, so the coaches could not only identify top prospects, but sort of strengthen relationships uh, with the coaches in the state and in Maryland, North Carolina. So th that always does come into play, uh, you know, because, you know, there's the tape evaluation and, you know, there's the transcript, but then, you know, you got to talk to a couple people about what kind of competitor is he, how does, how does he take coaching? Uh, you know, everybody sort of develops at, at different rates of speed. Uh, you know, some people are late bloomers, some people were stars in ninth grade. And, uh, but it was important. And uh, I think that's one of the advantages of, you know, doing a great job in your state and, and the border states is, you know, hopefully those relationships long-term uh, continue to strengthen. And, and, you know, so the, the trust factor, uh, you know, who you can talk to and get legitimate information uh, because then you're gonna be more successful in terms of who you choose to take. And you mentioned time is money. Is there anything out of these current circumstances that you've learned, uh, kind of impressed to learn that you might use, utilize going forward uh, in the recruiting process that you would not have done in the past? Well, you know, I do think that uh, the, the, the Zoom stuff was all very effective. And uh, so once we're back in the normal cycle, uh, you know, how we do incorporate that you know, into the normal recruiting process. But I'm still a big believer in, in the camps, uh, getting prospects on campus, being able to work them out uh, in June and July. You know, I think that's invaluable. So um, I think we've all learned from this. There's things we'll definitely take from it. And, but who's to say that this next class, you know, still might not be put together the same way this past one was. We really don't know that yet. Yeah, we may, maybe the future will really figure out uh, how much impact it'll take on that next class. Thank you, Coach. Do appreciate that. Happy holidays to you. Thank you. Next up, we've got Clint Estes from the Jamie Broadcast Network. Coach, congratulations on the, these recruits. But of your 12 commitments, how many have, have participated in previous JMU camps uh, before now? And also, a second follow up is how does that getting a player to your camp impact in recruiting? None of these guys were in our camp, you know, because our camps, our camps got canceled. None of them were in the year before. Yeah. I was speaking of the year before, right? Yeah. None of them were in the year before. So, uh, <clears throat> but you would love to, you would love to get players in, in the camp because, you know, sort of the hit rate, the success, success, succeed rate is usually a lot higher when you've had them in camp. But, uh, you know, we all had to play by the same rules this year and, you know, I like every one of these guys we got. And, well, you know, the thing I'll say about these guys is they all have the ability to be successful here, physical ability. They're all really good students. I mean, and, uh, you know, they were leaders uh, on their football team, high character, and you can't go wrong. Uh, usually if you have the athletics and the academics, you can't go wrong. Thank you, Coach. All right, we'll have some follow-ups from uh, Greg Medea. Kurt, just wanted to ask you about Matai Fitz. I uh, haven't gotten a comment from you about him yet. What, what type of player is he? I know he had a lot of sacks, a lot of tackles for losses as a high school player. Yeah, he right away, the guys on defense really liked him a lot. He was at the top of the board. He had a lot of offers, uh, FBS offers too. Uh, and very quick, good get off, plays with, you know, great motor. And uh, just really excited about him. And, uh, you know, it's a position that's always, you know, critical to get good ones up front on defense. Uh, and then uh, just in terms of versatility, I know a bunch of those guys were, were good offensive players and good defensive players, regardless of what they'll do for you guys. Uh, how much do you guys value that when you turn on the tape and you see Benkowski can play running back, but he's a really good linebacker or D-end, and you see Horton play tight end and D-end. How do you value that, and how do you guys assess that? I think that's pretty big. Uh, like, you know, Benkowski was a good running back and, you know, I haven't seen, and so was Jalen Walker. 
I haven't seen many guys that were good running backs that weren't good linebackers. And, uh, you know, uh, Messiah Russell played corner, but he played receiver. And, you know, I always like to see those defensive backs excel on offense if you can, uh, because defensive backs sometimes are really hard to evaluate just on tape. Um, but if they excel on offense, you get a better idea of what their athletic ability is. And Zach Horton was the same way. And uh, so that to me, that just adds to their value. And uh, it probably does bump them up a, a little bit. And plus, you know, they're not coming off the field. And if they're playing hard from the beginning of the game to the end of the game, then that tells you something. Thanks. All right, we'll head back to Dave Thomas. Coach, talking about uh, the guys getting an extra year, have has your staff begun conversations with your seniors about what their intentions are? Or if you have it, when do you plan to have those conversations? No, we have uh, right away when uh, the rule came out. Uh, you know, we talked to our seniors, got an idea what they were thinking. And then I met with every player uh, at the end of fall ball one-on-one -on -one, uh, and sat down. So we've got a pretty good idea of what everybody's thinking right now. And, uh, but everybody's focus is on this spring season. And what, if any, contact are you having with your team now that they're away from campus wrapping up exams? So they've been gone for a little while uh, since fall ball wrapped up. As far as are, are, you, are your coaches staying in contact with them on a fairly regular basis about working out and just seeing how they're doing? Or are you kind of giving them time to do their own thing with their families? Well, we brought the whole team back after Thanksgiving and, and had two weeks of mandatory training. So uh, the guys that went home didn't go home until uh, Friday, four or five days ago. And we probably got about 30 guys here still uh, taking finals and uh, they're allowed to lift and work out. It just can't be mandatory. So we got about 20, 30 guys here right now. So the ones that have been home haven't been home very long. But, uh, you know, Derek, uh, one thing about Derek, man, he's on top of things. Uh, and he'll do a great job of staying on in about nutrition and, you know, what they're doing working out wise. And, you know, he's got a program for him and, and the position coach as well, too, because everybody knows it's a quick turnaround. I think it's about 20. 21, 22 days before they come back. And uh, so, but they've earned this little break. Uh, you know, we've been going uh, pretty steady here for a while, uh, chance to get away. But, you know, you'd be surprised when you talk to them. Uh, you know, some of the younger ones are sort of excited to go home and they understand that after four or five days, they're going to get a little bored. And, you know, a lot of the kids are, are you know, would rather stay and train, <laughs> but they're not allowed to. And, it, you know, it's important they all get home with, you know, their family for the holidays. But, uh, you know, uh, I think I think guys are pretty focused in on the spring season. And uh, I like where we're at right now. And your final question will come uh, from TJ Eck. Yeah, Coach, this has nothing to do with signing day. Um, we just saw that recently Dimitri Holloway has signed to play in the CFL. Um just kind of your thoughts on, on, on Dimitri getting that opportunity. He's someone who obviously had a great career, but also dealt with, I know, some injuries at JMU as well. What, do you, what are your thoughts on, on Dimitri getting that chance to play professionally? Can't say enough good things about Dimitri Holloway. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when the defense was out there on the field, uh, his voice was the one that carried, you know, the most weight. You know, Rondell kind of controlled the team a little bit, but Dimitri on defense, and he's just such a likable guy, got such a great personality, loves to play football, really good football player, really instinctive. He's had some tough injuries. You know, I think whenever football does end, whenever that day is, he's got a tremendous future. Uh, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a Duke through and through. He loves JMU. And, uh, you know, I, I wish him nothing but the best. And I hope, you know, I, I hope he can play football as long as he desires. And then afterwards, uh, there's a guy probably be a really good football coach. Well, Coach, we appreciate your time with uh, the media today, and thanks to all the members of the media for joining us to, uh, today for our National Signing Day press conference. Great. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Go Dukes. <laughs>